Now this case is great. I really love this case. Uh, it taught me a lot of good lessons. So I hope you like it also. Let me pull up the history here. This is case four, a 19 year old female with a distal forearm nodule. And I can't remember her age, but it was right around 19. Uh, uh, she was, she was a late teens or early twenties and it was a woman and it was the distal forearm. And so this nodule was excised and sent to me as a consult. Now, if you've looked at this before, you probably noticed that we've got, we've got a biphasic lesion here. We've got a solid nodule or multi-nodular area on the right-hand side here. And on the left, we have a multi-nodular, uh, very loose myxoid lesion with patchy areas of cellularity. So let's start with the cellular area because I think many times when I look at a slide and I see a lot of stuff going on, it's really easy to go straight to the cellular most cellular, most ugly looking area. And that's fine to do. But one thing I've noticed is because I have a bias towards doing that, sometimes I try to force myself to look away. I know that there's abnormality here in the middle, of course. So I try to look from low power at the rest of the slide first. Check the periphery, make sure there's nothing going on in the epidermis. I do this even in my regular derm path work when I'm looking at a basal cell or a nevus or a seborrheic keratosis. Before I go down closer, I look at 2X and just scan over to the edges real quick and make sure I'm not missing some subtle melanoma in situ in the background or something else. Check the margins real quick and see, you know, am I dealing with something that's a completely removed, mostly removed, or broadly transected? Here in the United States, we get a lot of shave biopsies that are broadly transected. I know in other parts of the world, that's not as common. I'm not sure how it is in Australia. Maybe one of you guys can tweet at me online and tell me how it is. I'm always interested to learn the practice variations in different parts of the world uh, because it really can be quite different. And it, some of the stuff that I spent a lot of time teaching about for my colleagues in the U.S. Uh, um, ends up not being very helpful to other people in other parts of the world where they're used to getting complete excisions of things all the time. And I'm, I'm telling them, here's how you hedge on a shave biopsy. So in any case, that's one little tip for the junior trainees in the audience is, is don't just go straight high power on the most ugly area, okay? Look around first and get the lay of the land because you may pick up on subtleties that you would miss and that you would, would overlook or would ignore once you're fixated on what's going on in the bad area, okay? This area does look quite bad. It's cellular, large cells with kind of uh, large uh, nuclei, open chromatin, very, very pale, kind of washed out or vesicular open chromatin. Mitotic activity, uh, it, you know, that's one thing. I love digital slides, but I find that mitoses often don't stand out quite as well on uh, scan slides. Uh, this is an older scan from an older model of scanner, so uh, I think newer scanners may do better with this, but I know that some of my scan slides, I have trouble seeing the mitoses as well. But there were mitoses here, a fair number, in fact. We do have a cellular tumor with large nuclei and scattered pleomorphic cells. I saw even on the, the glass H&E, I'm not sure if they show up here, but I saw several atypical mitotic figures um, that were, were distinctly abnormal. So pretty worrisome, right? High cellularity, uh, large nuclei, pleomorphism, increased mitotic activity, and atypical mitotic figures. I mean, it's checking a lot of the boxes for malignant right away. So right off the bat, you'd be worried about sarcoma. But if it's a sarcoma, what kind? What are we going to call this? We could think about a melanoma, but... That doesn't really look right for that. It's a nodule deep down. I mean, if it were a melanoma, it'd be a metastatic melanoma. You could think of maybe a clear cell sarcoma, but the pattern's not really right. Um, with the myxoid areas, you could think of a myxofibrous sarcoma, which often do occur in the skin or subcutis, but almost always in old, usually elderly adults. I, I have never personally seen a myxofibrous sarcoma in a patient in their teens or 20s. You know, some of that stuff has been reported in the literature, in the older literature particularly, but I'm often very skeptical of those kind of reports. Now, admittedly, I've not read them all, so maybe I'm being judgy without giving them a fair, a fair chance to prove themselves. But, you know, uh, I, my personal view is if you think it's a mix of fibrous sarcoma and the patient's under the age of 50 even, I would be very cautious. I think I've seen maybe one or two in people in their late 40s but I'm still pretty skeptical there. So I really look at that very suspiciously and double check to make sure I'm not missing something else. If a patient's, you know, not in the 50s or older, and usually patients with mix of fibers are 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond, okay? So um, atypical, kind of histiocyte looking cells, 
The other thing I'll point out is a lot of multinucleated cells with similar looking nuclei to the tumor cells in the background. So I would argue that rather than being like background tooth on giant cells, these really probably represent tumor giant cells. And yeah, all the tumor cells look kind of histiocytic, but you know, these really have the same exact to me nuclear features as the background, this kind of washed out, almost, almost vacuolated looking uh, nuclei. All right. And again, scattered pleomorphism too, but, but many of the really ugliest looking cells are actually because of multinucleation. Now let's go over and look at the myxoid areas. I think in, in this case, we got lucky because we had the myxoid areas. If you just had that hypercellular area, we could really struggle with this case and we could potentially make a big mistake. In these areas, I think that anyone who's seen it before will recognize that we have thin spindly cells that are kind of an elongated, almost chain-like structures that slightly swirl in this loose myxoid background. Now, I know this, this background here really looks more like white edema rather than blue mucin or myxoid. I use the words mucin and myxoid kind of interchangeably. Um, you know, I find path trained people tend to say the word myxoid um, and derm trained people often use the word mucin when we're talking in the derm path world or the soft tissue world about glycosaminoglycans, ground substance, hyaluronic acid, whatever words you want to use for that stromal type mucin or myxoid change. Here we can see some blue mucin or myxoid change, but I do find that in slides, in recut slides, the mucin and myxoid stuff is the first of the stuff to fade and it often goes and disappears really quickly in recut H&Es, which is one of the big benefits of scanning slides and digital microscopy for teaching is it preserves that crisp original H&E because there's nothing more disheartening than looking just a couple years down the road on recuts already fading and it's pretty sad. But here's some kind of stippled dot like myxoid or mucin. So when we have these um, spindle cells with kind of chains that are swirling in a myxoid background in these little small nodules or nest-like or theek-like structures with fibrous septations in between, these are the features that remind us of what used to be called um, conventional neurothechioma or myxoid neurothechioma. And the more preferred modern term that I like now is um, mix or is um, nerve sheath myxoma. So the entity formerly known as myxoid neurothechioma or conventional neurothechioma is now referred to as nerve sheath myxoma. So when you see areas that look like conventional myxoid neurothechioma slash nerve sheath myxoma next to a more cellular lesion that often also has multinodularity with intervening fibrous septations, then what the answer is almost always is going to be cellular neurothechioma. And the reason there's a, I've got a longer video that explains the history here, but the basic very down and dirty ex explanation is that originally the first neurothechioma was describing a lesion that looked more or less like this and was called neurothechioma um, that had myxoid, kind of hypocellular swirled spindled nodules with fibrous septations in between. And then later, people saw that sometimes lesions like that had cellular areas. And so the idea became that lesions that were all cellular and multinodular were cellular neurothechiomas. Lesions that were all myxoid were myxoid neurothechiomas. And then lesions like this one that have both were mixed pattern or mixed type neurothechioma. But with um, more modern immunistic chemistry, what we recognize is that's all rubbish, actually. Okay, so the, the confusion of naming is makes sense historically. But in modern times, we know that if you have one that is purely like this and you stain it for SOX10 and S100, it will be positive. And those are true nerve sheath, mix, uh, nerve sheath tumors, probably on a spectrum with schwannoma, actually. I've seen ones that actually had a uh, nuclear palisading resembling barricade bodies. And those are true nerve sheath uh, tumors, and we should probably call those um, uh, uh, nerve sheath myxomas, okay? And if you have cellular areas, either partially or an entire tumor composed of cellular areas, we call those cellular neurothechioma, and they are negative for S100 and negative for SOX10, and they are not at all a nerve sheath tumor, and the name is completely a misnomer. And we just have to accept, like many other entity names we use because they're entrenched in the literature, that we use the term even though it's a misnomer because people understand what it means. So just recognize that the cellular neurothechioma is called neurothechioma, but it's not a nerve sheath tumor. It often has myxoid areas, about 50% or more, I think, even of cases, will have some myxoid areas, so that's a very helpful clue to the diagnosis. And sometimes will strikingly resemble 
nerve sheath myxoma, but even these areas, they will be negative for S100 and SOX10. In every single case that I've seen that had a so-called mix type, the entire tumor was negative for neural markers, S100, SOX10. So these are just cellular nerve ethiomas with myxoid change, which is a common finding. Mitotic activity is common in cellular nerve ethiomas, and in a small subset, you can even get atypical mitotic figures. Nuclear atypia is common and, and can be really extreme in a small subset of cases. Multinucleated giant cells, often with kind of an osteoclast looking appearance, um, is very common in cellular nerve Most cellular nerve ethiomas that I've seen have a distinct kind of pale, washed out, histiocyte looking nuclear chromatin. And so I feel like with practice, cellular nerve ethiomas, just by the nuclear feature, I start thinking of cellular nerve ethiomas. This nuclear pattern right here, I don't know how to put it into words. Pale, washed out, fasciculated, something about that with abundant cytoplasm and a kind of sheet-like growth with some multinodularity, right away I think of cellular nerve ethiomas. And also I will think of epithelioid fibrous histiocytoma, which we saw earlier because I feel like they have a similar um, cytologic feature, okay? Um, oftentimes the growth pattern is a little different, but I think those are fair things to think about. Okay, and what has been shown fascinatingly is that in the big studies by, uh, by Chris Fletcher and Jason Hornick, I think still have the largest series in the literature, that even when you have atypical mitotic figures, really atypical, um, bizarre pleomorphic nuclei scattered in the tumor, hypercellularity, all of those patients still have a good outcome, and these tumors, even though they look malignant, they do not behave in a malignant fashion. So in cellular neurothechioma, it appears that nuclear atypia and mitotic activity do not predict behavior, okay? The biggest struggle for me is how do we know for sure that we're dealing with the cellular nerve ethioma? Number one, all the cytologic and morphologic features I just told you, those are the most helpful things. The next thing is the immunohistochemistry, unfortunately, is not terribly helpful here. Yes, there are a variety of markers that have been reported as positive. NKIC3, also known as CD63, is usually positive in these. Neuron-specific enolase, NSE, is usually positive in these, but those are both very non-specific markers. Neuron-specific enolase, to me, is total rubbish. I don't use it for anything. It stains all sorts of stuff, so I personally find it worthless, and I basically never order it. It's in the Vimentin corner uh, for me, which basically means if someone sends me a consult and there's a Vimentin or an NSE, those are going to the bottom right side of the tray where the, where the negative controls go, and I flip them upside down, I don't even look at them. Rubbish, okay? Um, they are worthless stains in my opinion, okay? Maybe I'm getting old and, and I'm being a little bit of a curmudgeon now, but I don't like those stains. Um, uh, and then also other things like PGP 9.5 and a variety of other markers, MITF, are reported in this, this tumor. But I feel the problem is, is those things are all pretty nonspecific and they can, most of them can stain melanocytic things and histiocytic things, which is going to be your main differential when you're looking at a case like this. Histiocytic things and melanocytic things could come into mind here. So if I think it looks like cellular neurothechioma and I do an S100 or SOX10 and it's negative, I feel pretty happy making the diagnosis just on ruling out a melanocytic tumor because I think in a, particularly when it's purely cellular without the myxoid areas, I've seen some cases that can have some tight nesting that really look like a spitz nevus or a spitzoid or other melanocytic tumor. And because they can have mitotic activity and atypical mites, um, things that are totally fine in a cellular neurothechioma, but much more maybe concerning in the context of a, of a melanocytic lesion. So I think it's really important to make sure that you've excluded a melanocytic lesion. Now, in this particular case, I don't think you would probably wouldn't seriously consider a melanocytic lesion. Okay, so I've talked to death on that one, and now I'm going over time, but I think it's really important. The other thing that I want to point out is the real awesome kicker of this case that would be so easy to overlook. Look at this. This is classic, tight little feeks or nests of bland histiocytoid cells, the classic cellular neurothechioma, just a little bit of it, a little tiny cluster of it right at the edge, which seals the deal here if we had any doubt. This is definitely a cellular neurothechioma. And there's another area up here in the corner that is a little bit more robust, but also very, if you've seen a cellular neurothechioma before, I think you'll agree with me, even if the stuff in the middle here looks really wild, this stuff looks great for cellular neurothechioma. And this is now, I, I have also seen another case years later after this one, and it was one that had actually been reviewed by, um, 
by another pathologist and called uh, a sarcoma in a young adult uh, woman. And um, I reviewed it again. And I think that that pathologist, a very good pathologist, actually, I think they just overlooked an area like this that was there. And after looking at that, I thought, I think this is just a atypical cellular ethichioma. And my personal view is I do like these to be excised with a negative margin, ideally if it's clinically feasible. Now, when it's on the nose of a, of a kid or a young adult, you got to then have to weigh the pros and cons there. But I do feel like if it were on me and I had atypical mites and stuff, even though the literature says it's fine, I personally would want it removed. If it were on my kid or my wife, I would want it removed. But I'm also a paranoid pathologist, so maybe that's overkill. So I think it's worth having a discussion of risk versus benefit. I think the literature supports that maybe it's okay to watch and wait on these. But I think if it's, if it's not too morbid to remove it with a little margin, probably that's a good idea. I can't remember in this case if I told them to go back or if I said because it's pretty much out here just focally at the margin, I think I may have told them to watch and wait closely. And I never did receive follow-up, but I never never got anyone contacting me and telling me, oh, by the way, something bad happened here. So it's always unsatisfying because you don't really know what happened in a case like that. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed this case, even though I spent a long time on it. I really feel like there's a lot of real great take-home pearls to be learned. And it's a case that years and years later, I've remembered distinctly because I learned so much from it.